Yo, what's up guys? We're back for another UFC breakdown and predictions video. And this week it's for UFC 284 pay-per-view. We're going back to Australia for the first time in a long time. And we got two title fights. So definitely should be a really fun card. And just hit that like button. Subscribe if you're not subscribed. Put a comment down below. And let's get into this first fight here with Zubair Tugov. He's going to be taking on Elvis Brenner. And we see here right away that Zubair is a huge favorite. I think he's minus 600 now. They got him at minus 500 on the Tapology page, but I think his line has moved a little bit. And Brenner, he's making his debut in the UFC. Zubair's been in the UFC for a long time, and he's mixed it with a lot of really high-level guys, top 15 guys. So definitely think that plays a big factor in the line and why most people are picking Zubair to win pretty dominantly. And when you look at the styles of both guys, Elvis Brenner... He's younger, he's aggressive, he comes out of shoot box, so you know he's going to come forward, pressure Muay Thai, has good grappling, and his wrestling doesn't really seem that great, I feel like you could take him down, his takedown offense isn't really that effective, but his grappling is high level, if you bring him on the ground, he's going to throw up submissions, he's going to look to sweep you, and if he's on top, he's going to be dangerous, I feel like someone like Tehugov with the top pressure, with the experience that he has, the wrestling it. Uh, chops that he has I think he probably will be able to manage being on top if he is on top and stall out Brenner so Brenner in this fight is in my opinion most likely gonna have to win it with the stand-up if he does win it or catching a tired Zubaira in a submission but I, I just don't think that is as likely but on the feet he is very hittable he doesn't move his head he does have decent offense and he's pretty long for the way he'll throw some nice uh, pull twos, counter twos, knees up the middle. And he tries to stay in your face and keep the volume high. And Zubaira, we know how he fights. Uh, he's fought in the UFC for a long time. Kind of has that Russian striking style where they stand real tall, real light on their feet, bouncing in and out. And then he has that big overhands, the uh, big left hooks, throws heat. He actually has very fast hands as well, so he's a dangerous striker. And early on in the fights, he has power. He's throwing a lot. He's explosive. He closes the gap quick. But he does tend to be a guy that slows down, so he has to manage his gas tank. It doesn't really open up. He can be pretty low volume. His counterpunching ability and just his ability to land in general, I think is going to give Brenner problems, though, because of the power that he has early. I think Brenner has to be very careful and not get in a firefight. He is pretty durable from what I've seen. I've seen him get dropped and come back in the fight, so he's well-conditioned as well, Brenner. So Zubaira, I don't know if he's going to necessarily knock him out. I think he has the opportunity to, but if it doesn't happen early, I think it's probably going to have to be three rounds for Tugoff. And Tugoff always has that wrestling in his back pocket, even though he doesn't use his wrestling as often as he should or that frequently in a lot of his fights. He can go to it, take guys down, blank it up. We saw that when he fought Laron Murphy and when he's fought in other strikers or explosive fighters that have given him some issues and in this fight, I just think that Zubair has too much experience. I think that his ability to mix it up and his power, his speed edge closing the distance is going to play a big factor. I think Brenner has pretty good weapons. His length, it makes him more effective than he is technical on the feet. But I think Tehugov has the edge and the footwork and the speed. I think that he has the power advantage too. And I think he's going to take advantage of the defensive deficiencies from Brenner. And I also feel like... His wrestling is on another level. He can't sleep on the grappling of Elvis Brenner. He has to be aware. He has to be alert. Not allow himself to get swept or submitted. But I think if Tugov gets takedowns, he'll probably be able to stall Brenner out. I don't think Brenner's really going to be looking to get back up to his feet too aggressively. I think he's going to accept that position and play jiu-jitsu. And I could see that being a factor in the fight. Tugov is going to have to come in here in shape, which is always going to be something that you have to have be a little bit worried about, especially with the travel here. He's going to have to be going to Australia, and there's a big time change as well. So at this line, I wouldn't really have anything to do with Tugov. I would just stay away from this fight. I think, if anything, Brenner has a little bit of value, but I just don't see him getting the victory personally. I think Zubair is just a little bit too experienced. He's a little bit better in the striking and a little bit better in the wrestling, so I think he's going to be able to get the job done and get this win by decision. And this next fight, we got another fight where we got a UFC veteran taking on a UFC debutant, Shane Young. He's had a few fights in the UFC now. Blake Builder, this is going to be his debut coming off the Contender Series. This matchup, I don't really rate Shane Young in the same class as his buyer to Hugoff. He's more of a 
lower level to mid tier fighter in the weight class. So I think that this is a much closer fight. Blake Builder's undefeated. He's the Cage Fury or former Cage Fury champion at this point. He got a big win on the contender series. And he's gotten quite a few finishes. He's a dangerous guy. Shane Young recently hasn't looked the best. He's been kind of trying to find himself. He went up to 55. It didn't really work out. He is 0-2 in his last two fights. And he has been able to win against some pretty low-level competition in the UFC. But hasn't gotten that big win yet. This is going to be a win that is going to secure him his job. And probably give him another chance to fight a um, more recognizable name so it's a definitely a huge fight for Shane Young 29 years old he needs this win to stay in the UFC but he's one of these guys that's taken a lot of punishment and he got knocked out and then his last fight to me he was a little bit gun shy so hopefully he's gonna have his mentality on point and his durability is gonna be there as well for him but on the feet Shane Young technically is the better striker Blake Builder is more of a grappler. He's not really the greatest striker in my opinion. He's short, he's compact, and he's kind of shifty. He'll switch stances. He um, is pretty explosive as power. I would say he's the power advantage. Throws decent combos. He'll uh, attack the body to open up the head. Mostly punches. And um, his chin, though, and defense are not the greatest. I've seen him dropped quite a few times. One thing about him is he is uh, very durable because of his cardio. He's extremely well conditioned you see him push a really crazy pace and he can get dropped and recover really quickly so that's something you have to be aware of with him you can't expect you expect him to get out of there early you have to maintain your gas tank and Shane Young he used to be a guy that relied a lot on volume he would come forward work behind the jab pull counter guys faint a lot throw a lot of leg kicks and like I said his last fight he got knocked out against Ludovic Klein with a head kick and his last fight, he didn't pull the trigger quite as much. And if that continues in this fight, I think he's going to struggle to win fights at the UFC level because what makes him good is his you know willingness to get into that fire, exchange, take shots to give shots. Because even though he's decent at pool countering, he has the length advantage in this fight and he should um, be able to use it fairly effectively. I think the leg kicks will be the best weapon for him. But he is hittable as well, and he's not necessarily the best with his defense. So Builder, a guy that can close that gap and touch you up and has the power advantage, it's always going to be a dangerous fight for Young because he doesn't have that power to usually get guys out of there clean. Um, and Builder, he's the better grappler. The wrestling, I don't really know. I feel like Builder probably has a slight edge in pure wrestling, but he's not necessarily the best wrestler for MMA. What he is good at is... He's good at finding the back. He just finds the back in uh, scrambles on the feet, and he's pretty good at that. And when he gets to that back, he can finish the fight with Rooney Kachoke. So Builder is going to be looking to find any opportunity to uh, get the back of Shane Young a slip, you know, flurrying on him and then circling to the back really quickly. That's his thing. And then he could jump on the back and get the hooks in really fast and look for that choke. So I think that's going to be Builder's best avenue I think he needs to use his striking to try to open up that back take or get a takedown if he can just traditionally against the cage or something but I th I feel like Builder I'm just gonna roll with him here just just because of the stage of the career that both these guys are in I don't like Shane Young's last couple fights getting knocked out and then being a little bit gun shy in his last fight and Blake Builder is a guy that is a comeback king man he can be losing the fight come back at the win he is very mentally tough he comes in great shape and he's a finisher and this fight Shane Young's hard to submit so I feel like he might in this fight actually get a decision win backpack him a couple rounds and get the win that way I think Shane Young might have some success on the feet but I think he's not gonna open up as much as he should I don't think his volume is gonna be where it needs to be and I think Builder's gonna take advantage of that by being a little bit more aggressive using his explosiveness to get inside and eventually somehow get it to the ground so i'm gonna go with builder to win this fight be a decision actually and for this next fight we got loma luke budmi she's coming back she's taking on elise reed this is gonna be a striking fight it should be interesting loma luke budmi she's the only thai fighter in the ufc she's someone that's in my opinion one of the best strikers at 115 pounds and probably in female MMA in general she is uh, very fun to watch she's a little bit undersized for the weight class but 
In this one, she's taking on another girl that could probably be a 105 or has actually fought a 105 in Elise Reed. And Elise Reed, she has been pretty good in the UFC. She's gotten a couple big upset wins her last fight. She cast as an over 2-1 to one underdog against Melissa Martinez, who's another girl that has a fun striking style. So Reed, she's down to go in there and bang. And when you look at this fight, both these girls, um, Loma Luke Boonmi definitely, in my opinion, has been a little bit more impressive. She's fought the better competition as well. And I feel like she training at Tiger Muay Thai is definitely getting a lot better. You see in her last fight, she was able to u- utilize that grappling to get the win. She mixed in some takedowns, top control, and used that to get the decision victory over Denise Gomez, a very good pressure fighter. Elise Reed, she's someone that doesn't have the best grappling in my opinion. I wouldn't be shocked if Luke Boudmi went the route of trying to clinch her. Use that tie clinch that's really, really incredible for Luke Boomi. The elbows, the knees, maybe get a couple takedowns and make the fight very definitive. Because at range, Elise Reed does have some decent weapons. She's someone that could switch stance. She has a nice straight right, straight left. She has kind of loose hands. She'll throw some decent combinations. She has that taekwondo style. She'll mix in a lot of kicks also. She throws a lot of lead leg side kicks. She could throw question mark kicks, but really the main weapon that she has is those crosses. She has power in her hands as well. So she doesn't have knockout power. I mean, as most of these 115 pounds girls don't have, but she definitely has the ability to sting girls and she hits harder than the average straw weight. Luke Boonmi, she definitely has power in the kicks and the knees, but I don't think she has necessarily the best power in her hands. I think that Elise Reed has a slight edge just in the pure boxing and handwork but Loma Luke Bumi overall has way more weapons I think she mixes it up a lot better and I think that the clinch is going to be a big factor I think that Luke Bumi is going to look for that clinch he's going to probably get at least retired in the clinch throw a lot of knees I think she's going to be able to hit a takedown or two and I, I feel this is going to be a fairly comprehensive easy victory for Luke Bumi by decision it's hard for Luke Bumi to finish fighters just with her stature and she doesn't have that knockout power but I think she's just gonna overwhelm Reed with her full arsenal and uh, be able to get this win by decision 30-27 29-28 at worst so give me Loma Luke Boomi to win this fight and I think she has pretty good value I think you could parlay her with a couple other pieces on this card and I think uh, Luke Boomi is a pretty solid pick here and up next here we got Jack Jenkins he's taking on Don Shanus this is a fun fight here we got Jack Jenkins making his debut but I think he's uh, fighter to watch and he's a huge favorite here taking John Shanus who's in the second UFC fight but really you could argue this is his debut he only lasted 30 seconds against Sadiq Yusuf in a really tough short notice matchup against someone in the top 15 this is his chance to show what he's worth and stick around in the UFC because another loss I wouldn't be shocked if he's cut from the company but Don Shanus he's not a bad opponent to have here coming to Australia to take on the Australian Jack Jenkins he is someone that has made his way on the regional scene. He got some decent wins on the regional scene. He beat fighters like Chris Lencioni, who's ranked up there in Bellator. And he has some skills. It's just I think he's not the best athlete, which holds him back a little bit. And Jack Jenkins, he's someone that is just coming up in his career. I don't think he's as experienced as Don Shanus. I don't think he's fought the level of opposition that Don Shanus has fought. But I do believe that he's the guy that is that athlete. He's someone that's very explosive. He's someone that is much faster, more powerful than Shanus. And that's one of his major advantages in this fight. When you break down how this fight plays out, I think on the feet, Jack Jenkins has a pretty significant advantage. When you look at Don Shanus, I don't really feel like he has the greatest striking. He is tough. He'll... You know, exchange hooks and try to mix in that check hook. His big overhand right is there. He'll throw some leg kicks, but kind of slow, plotty. And he's a grappler. He wants to get it to the ground, work his takedown game. Jack Jenkins, much more fluid on the feet. He, his style kind of reminds me a little bit of Jack Della Maddalena, who we're going to talk about later. I think it's kind of a poor man's version at this point. But he switches stances. He has real clean combinations, body head, he'll mix in the leg kicks, he'll uh, really rip, he really stays in your face, and he can keep that pressure. 
I don't think he has that power that Jack De La Maddalena has, but he definitely has the aggressiveness, the volume. He can keep the pace, and um, he's durable as well. His defense isn't exactly as good as I, as I would want it to be at this point. I definitely think he's a little bit of a hittable guy, but I do think that he has the chin right now to take it, and I think that his offense... Being his defense at this point against the opposition that he's facing, most of the time he's going to be able to go out there and run guys over. And when you look at his grappling, that's where Don Chanis is going to have the advantage. Don Chanis is going to want to try to get it to the ground, get on top, hold him down. I don't necessarily think that Chanis is going to be looking to submit him advanced position or do anything like that. I think if he gets him down, that's going to be where he wants to keep it. He's going to stick in that guard. He's going to go body head. He's going to mix in some elbows. Try to get the ref to not stand it up, being just active enough and win on points. And Jenkins, he's going to have to avoid getting put on his back because Sheamus is good at controlling guys. And Jenkins is someone that I do question his wrestling a little bit. I mean, we haven't really seen him face very many wrestlers, guys that try to take him down. And I have seen him get put on his back. And he's one of these guys that's super explosive. He's hard to hold down. He can reverse you get on top or explode back up to his feet create scrambles and I think that his gas tank is on another level in comparison to Don Shanus who I feel when he can't get his wrestling game going and he can't control you he tends to gas out so I feel like with those things being said Jack Jenkins having a clear edge on their feet being much more clean throwing more volume combination I combinations having better cardio, and I think Sheamus' wrestling isn't that elite. I think Jenkins is going to probably have the takedown defense to defend the majority of the takedowns, and if he can do that, I think Sheamus will start to wield under the pressure a little bit, get tired, and I think Jenkins can eventually knock him out. So I'm going to go with Jack Jenkins here via second round KO TKO. The only thing here with Don Sheamus is Sheamus is, is experienced, and Jenkins can't go out here and just think he's going to knock Sheamus out in the first minute and, you know, get tired or he can't end up on his back being crazy and slipping or just totally disrespecting the guy and ending up on bottom because he could end up stuck there for a whole round. But besides that, I think Jenkins has the edge. I think he's more athletic. He's younger. He is going to be coming in here with the momentum. Sheamus is coming off a big loss, quick loss. You don't know where his head's at. He's fighting at home. And I feel like he has edges pretty much everywhere in the fight except for off of his back. So give me Jack Chickens here via second round knockout. And this next fight, this should be a banger. This is probably going to be the best fight on the card thus far. And Jamie Malarkey, he's a known product at this point. He's the Australian here, so I'm sure he's going to be happy to be fighting back at home. It's been a while for him. And he's coming off a big time win. He just beat Michael Johnson. Who Say what you want about Michael Johnson. You could think that he's well past his prime, and that might be true, but he's a marquee name, and he's just coming off a win himself against Mark Jacasey, so he's definitely not totally washed up here. So that was a big victory for Malarkey, and he's taking on not probably the opponent that he wanted to face here, but he's taking on a UFC guy that's debuting here, undefeated 11-0 fighter out of Argentina, Francisco Prado, and... This is a fight for Malarkey to do good in. He ha probably has to win here. Not that his job's on the line or anything, but it's a fight where if he loses, he's going to drop significantly in the rankings. Right now, I would say he's probably that 25 to 30 range, pretty close to the top 15. But if he loses this fight, I think it's going to be tough for him to ever find his way back to that top 15 ranking. He'd have to win two, three, four fights in a row even. And Francisco Prado, he has nothing to lose here. He's coming into someone else's... Home country for his UFC debut, 20 years old, undefeated guy out of Argentina. And if he wins this fight, he's going to rocket himself up their weight class. But with Jamie Malarkey on the feet, he's a guy that has taken a lot of punishment. So you definitely have to wonder about his chin. But his toughness can never be questioned. And he's shown extreme durability in a lot of his fights. You look at that fight with Jalen Turner. Not many people have been able to like hold up to that firepower that Turner brings you. And Jimmy Malarkey, even though he got knocked out eventually, he took a lot of punishment and showed extreme toughness in that fight. And even though his striking when he came into the UFC was more reliant on him taking punishment to get inside and create brawls, he's gotten more technical now. He's using his reach better. He's a tall, lengthy guy for the weight class. 
He can mix it up with the punches and the kicks. He throws a little bit better combinations. He's a little bit more cognizant with the defense. So he's improving all of that. And with Francisco Prado, this guy's just a marauder on the feet. He comes forward, throws bombs, short, compact guy, young, like I said, 20 years old. So he has all the confidence in the world right now, and he has big power in his hands. So he wants to close close the gap on you, throw those big punches, overhands, hooks, get you against the cage, flurry, try to knock you out, and then take you down. And he has good wrestling. His wrestling, I wouldn't say, is elite. But one thing with Malarkey is we haven't really seen him fight any wrestlers yet in the UFC. And I don't know any grapplers he's fought in his career. I tried to go back and look at his record pre-UFC and see some guys that potentially took him down and held him down. But didn't have any luck with that. Because Prado is a guy that's going to be looking to do that. He's going to be wanting to use those big punches, close that gap, get inside, take him down. Very powerful guy. He has the big double leg, explosive he can hold guys down pretty effectively. His ground and pound has been very effective for him at the current level that he's at in Argentina. The level of opposition has definitely been low, so that's something that you have to question. And his striking defense is not really there. He doesn't move his head. Extremely hittable guy. I've seen certain fights where he's had fighters that have gotten up from under him and made him work to take him down. He's looked like he got a little bit tired. So I think his cardio could potentially be a little bit questionable as well. And this is just a big step up in competition. I think Prado looks like a beast. I mean, the guy has big power in his hands. He's explosive. He could wrestle a little bit. But Malarkey has been there. He's done that. I think he's a lot more technical on the feet. I think that he's proven his durability. He has the cardio edge. I think that coming to Australia is going to be a lot facing an Australian fighter on a pay-per-view in your debut. And the one thing that I'm not really sure about, like I said, is the wrestling defense for Malarkey. Is Prado going to be able to take him down? Maybe he will, but I feel like Malarkey is one of these scrappy guys, at least on the feet he is. And I don't think he's just going to allow someone to just hold him down on the ground. So I'm going to say he's able to scramble, get back up to his feet if he is taken down and use his cardio to his advantage, his experience. And I'm going to say Malarkey ends up getting Francisco Prado out of here. Either a late first round knockout or a second round knockout in this one for Malarkey. I think he's going to get him out of there with strikes. And it's going to be a good learning experience for Prado. But I'm going to say Malarkey gets it done and moves this streak to two fights in a row here. This next fight, this is another fight that should be all action. Shannon Ross coming in against Clitson Rodriguez. For both these guys, they came off the contender series. Shannon Ross is going to be his UFC debut. For Cleeton Rodriguez, this is going to be his second fight in the UFC after he was unsuccessful in his debut against CJ Vergara. And Shannon Ross, he's the Australian here, so he's going to have the home crowd behind him. He's the underdog. He is 33 years old, so pretty late start to be making the UFC debut at 33 years old, especially at this weight class. And Cleeton Rodriguez... He went in there in his UFC debut against CJ Vergara. And CJ Vergara is a tough guy to fight, man. The guy is crafty. He is tough. He pressures forward. And it was a close back and forth fight, but they gave the victory for to Vergara by split decision. And Cleach Rodriguez now has his back against the wall. He can't go a win two in the UFC. Shannon Ross, he actually lost on the contender series. He didn't get the contract, but he put on a really fun back and forth war type of fight and Dana White must have liked what he saw. He gave him the call here and gave him this fight here on the UFC 284 pay-per-view and both these guys like to strike. I think Rodriguez has a significant edge in the grappling and the wrestling department but on the feet it should be pretty entertaining if they want to keep it standing. Shannon Ross, he's one of these guys that he is a killer be killed fighter. He comes forward, has really sick combinations actually. Like he'll throw body head, he mixes in some head kicks, he'll throw some real nice front kicks, leg kicks, real fluid combos, stands right in front of you and will just go to war, try to throw heat. He has some power, but he doesn't necessarily have that one hitter quit quitter ability, and that's cost him, and I think that's a big detriment to his style because his defense is almost non-existent. The guy stands right in front of you. He switches stances sometimes right in the pocket, which I don't like to see because I just feel like it totally makes his defense just not where it needs to be and he can get clipped. 
And Shannon Ross's chin has just proven not to be the greatest. He gets hurt in a lot of fights. Man, he'll get dropped multiple times. He's been knocked out. His last fight, he got finished with strikes. And he definitely is the higher volume fighter. And I would say probably the cleaner striker offensively in terms of he throws those really nice combos. He picks his shots well. Cleetson Rodriguez more plays that sniper role where he's trying to land those nice uh, crosses in between your shots or a big jab. He's looking for the uh, counter elbows. I've seen him throw those. He has nice leg kicks, but he's not necessarily throwing that volume. He's not throwing big combinations, and he's more looking for the big punches, and then he has good body locks, pretty good grappling. You can get the back, and I feel like he's the more durable fighter the much more athletic fighter, and he's bigger in the matchup, which I also think is a big factor. I believe that Cleeton Rodriguez is going to be able to land those shots when Shannon Ross is pressuring him, throwing combinations. That's what he likes to do, man. He likes to sit back and pick those counters. Ross is going to give him a lot of opportunities to touch that chin, and I just don't trust that chin to hold up against Rodriguez. I'm not necessarily knowing if Rodriguez is going to knock him out, I feel like Rodriguez in his last fight, he was really gun shy, but in this fight, hopefully he opens up and that was just some jitters. And if he does open up and throw some heat, I think he could definitely hurt Ross and put him out of there. But it's just tough because of Rodriguez's last fight that kind of thrown me off a little bit. But I think even if he doesn't knock him out, he could hurt him and then get a submission. And even if Ross is giving him issues on the feet with the pressure and just being a little bit better in the pocket with the striking. I think Rodriguez could take him down too with the body locks, control him on top, maybe even get to a dominant position and submit him. I've seen Shannon Ross's wrestling and grappling and I wasn't too impressed with it overall. And 33 years old being a flyweight, you're getting up there and I feel like Ross is someone that's really fun to watch and they put him on this pay-per-view because they know he's going to bring it and going to go for that kill or be killed type of style. But I think Rodriguez is going to be able to get the finish here, whether it's Hurting him on the feet and TKOing him, knocking him out, or hurting him and getting on top and submitting him. But I think he's going to rock him at some point and be able to either finish him with strikes or finish him with a submission. So Clinton Rodriguez inside the distance is the pick for me. I'm going to say he wins by TKO, and I'm going to go with Clinton Rodriguez by second round. In this fight, this is a great clash of styles with between Josh Kolobau and Melsic Bagdasarian. With Josh Kolobau, he's going to be the fighter out of Australia, Bagdasarian, coming out of Armenia. He trains in California, and this is going to be his first fight out here in Australia, but definitely is used to traveling, fighting out of his comfort zone. And this should be a really, really fun fight to watch. With Melsic Bagdasarian, we got a former kickboxer, elite striker. He stands southpaw, which gives him another tricky element to his striking style. And he's an extremely accurate guy, man. I mean, the guy just has very, very good timing, very good accuracy with his punches, nice kicks. On the outside, he's not really a combination guy. He tends to try to land um, big overhands, check hooks, straight straight right hands, straight left hands. But when he gets on the inside, when he can back you up and get on the inside, the guy will rip the body with nasty hooks Big hooks up to the head. He's very good in the pocket. Like I said, his punches just land right on target. And he throws punches and bunches on the inside. He really goes to uh, hunt and kill guys. And he's strong. He's good in the clinch with his offensive weapons, elbows, knees. Overall, his wrestling, his grappling is a little bit questionable. I think that as he moves up in the rankings, that could be exposed a little bit. And... His defense on the feet could be better as well. He tends to really load up in the pocket, like I said, and he tries to go for the kill. And even though he can overwhelm a lot of guys and he can land some clean shots, I think that if fighters don't oblige him and stand right in front of him and they stick on that movement game, they could, you know, kind of touch him, pot shot him a little bit, and Bagazarian can get a little bit frustrated I feel like his cardio is a little bit questionable as well, especially if you try to mix in the grappling and force him to defend takedowns or clinch with you. And Josh Kolobau is that guy, man. Josh Kolobau is a very well-rounded fighter. He's been underrated since coming into the UFC. He was a big underdog. And against Jalen Turner, 
it was warranted. He didn't have what it took to go up a weight class and beat one of the biggest lightweights in the division. He gave it a good effort, but he got finished in the second round. But since then, he's fought in his traditional weight, and he's been able to do really well. He went in there against Charles Jordan. He was a huge underdog. In my opinion, he won that fight. They gave him a draw, and then he's won two fights in a row. Now he's coming off of a nice victory over Sung Woo Choi where he rocked him on several occasions and really showed a different element to his skill set. He looked really good that night. And one thing about Josh Kalabau is the guy's extremely fast, great footwork, and he can mix it up. And I think that's going to be a key element to him winning this fight. You know, I feel like early in the fight, he can't just exchange with Bagzeri and have a straight striking fight. He has to blend the striking and the wrestling, clinch him against the cage. Even if he's taking some damage with some clinch knees, maybe some elbows, and Melsa can disengage a couple times from the clinch, clinch him again, you know, you have to be willing to take some pain in this one against Bagdasari. And if you're going to beat this guy, you got to be willing to, you know, pay the price a little bit. This guy's going to really go out there and put some pain on you. But I think that if Kalabau is willing to endure a little bit early in that first round to close the distance, get inside, clinch Bagdasari in, just make him work a little bit. And then that'll pay dividends for the rest of the fight because I think Bagdasarian will not be as explosive. His volume won't be as there. And I think Kalabau can then use that striking, use the kicks on the outside, touch with the jab, use his speed, switch stance ability, and kind of pot shot Bagdasari and land some punches, be the guy that's throwing more combinations because Kalabal on the outside does tend to throw longer combos and um, just don't stay in the pocket with Bagdasari. And I think you could win doing that type of game plan, but it's just going to come down to if Kalabal can implement the grappling effectively and get Bagdasarian a little bit tired? Or is Bagdasarian going to be able to early on put damage on Kalabau where it offsets that cardio advantage that, in my opinion, he has that's going to be even more pronounced with the travel and Kalabau, you know, being at the luxury of fighting at home? Um, so is Bagdasarian going to be able to put enough damage on Kalabau in the first round that it makes him a little bit slower for the rest of the fight? I don't know. I think Kalabau has great fight IQ. And I think he's going to be smart in this fight. And I think he's going to do what he has to do. He's going to try to push the pace, press that grappling early, put Bagzari in against a cage, time a takedown if he can. And if he could do that, I think that's going to pay dividends in, for the rest of the fight for him. And I think he's going to be able to be more effective in the striking, competitive in the striking, maybe even have a slight edge in the striking as the fight wanes. So I'm going to say Kalabal wins in a competitive decision. And this, this next fight. fight for me is a tough one here with Tyson Pedro against Modestus Bukowskis. Tyson Pedro, he's a fighter that I can't quite get a great read on. He's very imposing. He has a lot of skills. He looks very technical. And recently he's returned from that layoff and ran through two guys, dominated Harry Hunsucker. He finished his other opponent in the first round as well, but... The level of opposition that he's had in those two fights have been extremely low. They've almost been kind of tune-up fights in a way after the layoff, you could almost say. And now he's taking on a real guy here in Modesto Bukowskis. Even though it's a short-notice fighter, you have to respect Modesto Bukowskis. You know, he was in the UFC before. He was able to be competitive against some good, good fighters in the UFC, but wasn't that, you know, good in his tenure, so he did get cut. And he ended up losing that fight, if you remember, to Khalil Roundtree via devastating uh, knee injury. And had to battle back from that. Went to Cage Warriors. Won the title at Cage Warriors. And now he's back in the UFC. So, in my opinion, I think he's going to be taking this fight extremely, extremely personal. I think he's going to be trying to make things right in the UFC. And, you know, show that in his comeback, he's going to be someone that is a force to be reckoned with. He just won a belt. He's going to have some confidence. He has that championship swagger. And I don't think he's going to be an easy guy to get out of there for Tyson Pedro. I don't see this just being like his fight with Harry Hunsucker where he can land a leg kick and end the fight. Or his fight with Ike Villanueva where he could take him out really quickly. I think it's going to be a more difficult fight. And Tyson Pedro does not have a lot of experience in long fights. Usually when he wins, he runs through guys in the first round. And I haven't really seen him 
have to battle through adversity and come back. I guess you could. I guess I'm wrong with that. I guess you could say the Khalil round two fight he did get dropped. He was able to end up getting the submission pretty quickly soon after that in the first round. But you look at certain fights that get pushed past the first round, man, and he just falls off a cliff. His volume is gone. For instance, with the fight with Alir Latifi, he just gets held down. I think a more worse example of it is the fight with Shogun Hua, where he really struggled in that fight. And Pedro, I think he's one of these guys that he definitely is a very elite striker. He has really technical boxing. And his kicks on the outside are very effective too. Good front kicks. He throws pretty heavy leg kicks, which I think he's going to be looking to use in this fight. And question mark kicks, head kicks, real fast kicks. But I think his one-twos, his check hook are really sharp. And when he gets inside, he'll, he'll attack the body. He could really land some nice tight shots in the pocket. And I think he has an edge there, pure boxing-wise. But uh, Bukowskis, he in my opinion, is going to be on the back foot, at least early. But he has a nice jab, and I think that what he needs to do is try to use that jab as Pedro comes in and clinch early on in the fight. And if he can do that, I think he's going to have the better cardio down the stretch. Bukowskis has shown it time and time again that he can come back late. He's gotten a lot of third-round finishes, fourth-round finishes. He's been in title fights, and he's not going to get tired. The guy comes in shape. And unless he's not been training that hard, this is a short notice fight. He just fought recently and he's someone that's been really wanting to come back in the UFC. So I'm sure he's been thinking, I got to stay in shape for a short notice opportunity. So I feel like he is going to come in ready to go. And Bukowskis is also more of a kickboxer. But I think if he can use that clinch and just kind of lean on Pedro, wear on him, and get him tired and then make it much more competitive in the striking. Because early on, I do think that Pedro has the speed edge. He is just a little bit more sharp. Bukowskis has good striking as well. Like I said, he has the jab. He has a pretty good uh, pull too. He keeps it long with his hands also. And then he'll mix in some spinning attacks and he's a little bit more, I would say, diverse with that than Pedro where he'll throw some spinning back fist, you know, spinning hook kicks and things like that. But I think that Pedro early on is going to have the speed edge and a little bit of a power advantage. And I just don't know if he's going to be able to get him out of there early, though. I think Bukas is going to be able to move around and stay safe, not get finished. And I just question Pedro's gas in that second and third round. I question that if Bukowskis lands a big jab or some big shots and starts to gain momentum, is Pedro going to be able to stick in that fight and, uh, you know, mentally battle back and make it a win in a dogfight situation. I don't know. I know Bukowskis can do that. And just with the line, man, I feel like this should be a closer line fight. I don't really see why Pedro is such a big favorite. When you look at, like I said, the fights where he had to actually battle through adversity and be in a tough fight that went a little bit longer, he just hasn't performed that well, in my opinion. And unless you're telling me that he's just going to run through Bukowskis, I don't see him being able to keep that pressure that he keeps on guys early in the fight for three rounds. I think that Bukowskis is going to eventually start to be able to change the tide of the fight and go forward, use his jab, maybe clinch, and use the kicks. And I just think he's going to have the more volume. And I also think that another thing that's playing a factor for me is just the mentality of both guys. I'm not saying that Pedro is mentally weak or he's not going to be up for this fight. But I think that Bukowskis has a lot of motivation having that knee injury, getting cut from the UFC, having a battle back and having this as his debut. I think he's going to be really, really willing to go out there and lay it all on the line to get a victory. And I just trust Bukowskis here if the going gets tough to come out on the other side of the victor. And I think that this fight is not going to be as easy as Pedro has had it for the last couple Fights that he's had with Harry Hunsucker, with Ike Villanueva. He hasn't been in a hard fight in a long time. And I think Pedro's going to get a little bit of a... I'm not going to say he's going to be done in the UFC or have a... I guess not like a reality check. But I think that he's just going to be in a tougher fight than he thinks it's going to be. And I think that Bukowskis is going to be able to get the win. I think he's going to be able to get a third round knockout. And this next fight is another fight in the light heavyweight division with Jimmy Crute taking on Alonzo Menafield. Jimmy Crute, the Australians, making his return after a pretty significant layoff due to a torn ACL and knee reconstructive surgery. 
He is taking on a guy that's been looking pretty good recently in Alonzo Menafield. He's won two fights in a row, two finishes in a row, but the level of competition has not been Jimmy Crute, who's in the rankings at number 12, as you see right there. And Alonzo Menafield, he's someone that came into the UFC with a lot of hype, just like Jimmy Crute. Both these guys were big-time prospects at one point. But the big difference is you see right there, Jimmy Crute is still 26, and he's already gotten a couple more marquee wins than Alonzo Menafield has gotten at 35. So Alonzo Menafield has to get going here. This is a big-time fight for his UFC career. If he wins this fight, he's going to jump into the rankings. He's going to be able to probably get a and warrant a top 10 opponent for his next fight. And that's where things could happen for him. You know, he's a big physical, explosive, powerful guy. And if he could knock out a guy in the top 10 with a name, then, you know, he could start talking about making some real money. So this is huge for Menafield at this point. Jimmy Crute is making his comeback. He hasn't fought in a long time. And he's coming off two, two finished losses in a row where he had the loss to Anthony Smith, where he had that peroneal nerve issue and ended up losing it with his uh, leg not being able to work after the first round. And then he got viciously knocked out in under a minute against Jamal Hill. And after that, he had to have knee surgery. So you don't know exactly where Jimmy Crude is at, in my opinion. Him being as big of a favorite as he is is not warranted because definitely isn't at a great point in his career. And in my opinion, I, I don't know what it is. I don't know. Maybe he had the knee injury for a while. But... I don't think his striking looked as good as it did in previous fights and his more recent fights. Maybe it was the level of competition as well or nerves, but he just seemed a little bit off. He wasn't as sharp as he was, for instance, in his fights with Modestus Bukowskis on the feet or even Sam Alvey. And I know you could point to the level of competition, but I'm just talking about just his movements, the strikes that he was throwing, and uh, he, he just seemed much more sharp. In those fights, but hopefully we can see a return of the Jimmy Crute of old here for the Jimmy Crute fans. And Alonzo Menafield, he's someone that on the feet, he has kind of that style where he uses a lot of head movement to get inside, throw big hooks, big overhands, and he can explosively close the distance, big power. And he also has decent counter punching abilities, so he's dangerous in that element as well. And one thing that I don't think people are giving up credit for Alonzo Menafield is he is a fairly good wrestler and grappler, man. I mean, his defensive wrestling is very on point. He has a great sprawl. And he can take guys down. He's explosive. He could shoot in and take you down. And one thing about Jimmy Crute that I think is a little bit overrated is his defensive wrestling. Offensive wrestling, Crute is uh, good when he can get it going. He blends it with the striking well. He times the doubles. And you've seen him dominate guys with his own offensive wrestling, like Mihal Luxaychek. He was able to uh, submit Paul Craig, even though he got taken on several times in that fight himself. He got a few takedowns. And he's shown um, good offensive wrestling, but he stands very tall. And he does that because he likes to throw a lot of kicks on the feet and stay quick and um, long. But it does kind of leave him susceptible to getting taken down. I think that his take on defense... Has not been tested too much. And we did see him get taken down though in his fight with Paul Craig. Which I don't think is a great sign. I mean we've seen Paul Craig fight in the UFC quite a bit. We know that he's a Jiu Jitsu A submission wizard. But his wrestling isn't really a strong point of his. We've seen multiple fights where he struggled to wrestle at a pool guard. And couldn't get it to the ground. So being able to take down a guy like Jimmy Crute several times. That isn't something that, in my opinion, is a great sign for Kroot. And Kroot also just had knee surgery. So I think that also makes you a little bit worried about the takedown defense. Menefield, if he takes him down, is very heavy on top and has good control. He's shown good ground upon. He's shown a good ability to get to that crucifix position and finish fights. I don't necessarily think he's going to be able to out-grapple and move into that crucifix or dominate into a position and finish Crude on the ground because Crude is a black belt and he's superior grappler but he could potentially smother him and control the position and win that way and Crude does have a really good Kimura off his back but I do think that's a sneaky thing that could potentially happen in this fight is Menafield trying to go for takedowns and 
holding crude on his back, trying to stay real heavy, real tight, and um, win that way. But on the feet, like I said, crew, if you go back and you watch his fight with Bukowskis, maybe a couple other fights, his striking looks sharp. I mean, he's staying long, throwing one twos down the pipe. He's throwing nice kicks. He's very fast. And if this fight's just on the outside, he's going to be the superior striker because he has the length advantage, even though uh, he, or not the reach, he actually has a much shorter reach, which is kind of weird because of the height, but he's taller. So with the kicks, he's going to have the advantage there. Menafield doesn't really throw a lot of kicks and he'll have the length with that. And um, I think he's just a little bit sharper, cleaner at range. But one thing about Crew is his defense is not good. Very hittable guy. And, you know, Menafield gets in and connects. We definitely know that he has big power, especially early. Crew just got flatlined in his last fight. So I definitely question his chin a little bit. And I just think this line is off, man. I feel like Menafield is the more explosive guy. I think he can get inside on Crew and land some big punches. He has the reach advantage by a pretty significant margin. I think that if he lands and connects clean early, he has the chance to not crewed out. And I also believe that he could mix in some takedowns potentially, control him on top and win that way, hold him against the cage. Crute, I do think, has a pretty big edge in the cardio department. So that could play a factor down the stretch if Manifield gasses out, Crute could take over and finish him. But... Just with the line, I'm going to go with Menafield to win this fight. And I'm going to say he actually wins by decision. I know that's a weird prediction, but that's just kind of what I think this fight's going to be. I think he's going to be able to mix in some takedowns. I think Crude's going to look a little bit rusty with the layoff. And I feel like Menafield's going to take advantage of that. And I'm going to go with Menafield by decision. And coming up next year, I don't really have a long breakdown for this fight. I'm not too interested in it from a betting perspective. Should be a fun fight to watch here, but two lower level heavyweights. One thing I do have to say with Parker Porter is he you do have to give him some respect, man. When he first came to the UFC, it was kind of funny to uh, poke fun at him. Obviously, his name is a little odd, and then he is a big fat guy. But, you know, he's proven, you know, he does his thing, man. The guy comes in great shape. He throws a lot of volume. He might not be the best fighter in the world. He might not be the most effective fighter in the world, but... If you go in there and you get tired against Parker Porter, he's going to put it on you. And if you go in there, you don't respect him, he's going to show off his skill set and he's going to beat you. So he's definitely a formidable fighter. He's very experienced, 20 pro fights. And Justin Toffa, he is definitely the scarier looking guy. He's the New Zealander, Samoan. He has a really good uh, brother that's a kickboxer that's supposed to be on this card that I believe sustained an inj injury and came off the card. But he's coming off a nice victory as well. Justin Taffa, first round knockout win over Harry Hunsucker. And this is a big time fight for Taffa, who's the younger guy, 29 years old, trying to progress and kind of has been up and down so far. He's 5-3 and three in his career. He's moved really quickly, obviously. Usually when you're 5-3, and three, you're not in the UFC, and he's already had quite a few UFC fights. And if he could beat Parker Porter then it'll show that he potentially is ready for that next level of opposition. If he loses, could potentially be cut because it, it's just hard to stay in the UFC at that lower level. With heavyweights, I wouldn't be surprised if they kept him around because he is fun to watch and he's someone that bangs. But it's just he would be in a danger zone there because he's a lower level and you can't afford to lose when you're at this level in the UFC. And he hasn't really beaten anyone great you know the guys that he's beaten have gotten cut and he has losses to fighters like Jared Vandera so I think this is a very important fight for Justin Taffa Parker Porter he got sacrificed I guess a little bit in his last fight against Almeida but he's gotten some good good wins man he beat Alan Badeau he got a win over Chase Sherman he got um another couple victories but Obviously, those aren't the highest level names, but they're fighters that are at the same level or around the same level as Justin Taffa. And I feel like Taffa is probably the more technical striker. Early on in the fight, Taffa is going to be throwing heat. He's going to be looking for that big left hand. He's going to be throwing the leg kicks. And that's going to be the danger time for Porter, who 
is definitely a very hittable guy. He's plotty. I don't think he has the speed or the technicality to match Taffa. But what Porter does have is this guy has a gas tank on him, man. And he's very, very durable because of that. He could take a lot of punishment and he sticks in the fight. And I think he can mix it up better. I think he could clinch. I think he could eventually get takedowns. He's going to be the heavier fighter. He's going to be a little bit thicker, a little bit bigger, a longer reach. And um, I think his volume on the feet is also going to potentially play a factor. The guy throws a lot of volume. The guy is, in my opinion, the fighter with significantly better cardio in this one. And even though Toff is in there and he's down to bang in fights and he's going to have a you know a big chance to get the knockout, I think if Porter could mix it up early, get a couple of takedowns, push Toff against the gauge, he could start to get him tired. We've seen Toff get really tired in fights, and he's just not that experienced, man. Five and three, only eight fights. A few of those fights before the UFC, he was fighting some low-level opposition, so even those fights aren't really that much experience you can't really gain much from those fights and I think Porter he's been in the octagon with some real high level guys man I mean this guy's been in the octagon with John Jones he has 20 pro fights he in my opinion is one of the most well-conditioned guys in the UFC he has uh elite toughness he's someone that's going to go in there and fight for your money and as the underdog in a low-level heavyweight fight that's kind of the side that I want to be on, the side that I think is a little bit more well-rounded as well. And I feel like if this fight gets out of the first round, Porter has a huge chance to win, so it could be a potential live bet opportunity. Toffa is one of these guys that hasn't fared well in decisions. Porter's one uh, undefeated in decisions in the UFC. And I think if this fight goes past the first, it's Porter's fight to take. So I'm going to go with Parker Porter by decision. And up next, man, we got another incredible matchup. Jack Della Maddalena versus Randy Brown. And I see some people really shitting on this card hard. And I could see where they're coming from from a name value perspective. I can agree with that. But I think there's quite a few matchups that are going to be fire fights, man, even though they might be from fighters that you don't really know. But this is another one, even though I think this is one where people are really looking forward to it. Jack Della versus Randy Brown. Randy Brown's a fighter that you got to give him credit because he's been in the UFC for a long time. Steadily improved. He's gotten into the top 15. He's fallen out of the top 15. And right now I think he's kind of very close right on the outside looking in. He's on a win streak right now. Coming off a win over always dangerous, always crafty veteran Francisco Trinaldo. And Jack Della Maddalena, he's surging up the rankings. He has won three fights in a row. He's knocked all his opponents out. He's looked extremely impressive. And he called for the shot. He wanted to fight in Australia. He was born in Perth, so you know the crowd's going to be behind him 100%. Not only is he in his home country, he's in where he's from, right in his backyard. And... The one thing about it with this fight that everyone has to deal with Randy Brown and why it's a tricky matchup is that length, man. Randy Brown is extremely long, extremely rangy, very tall fighter, and that's what Jack Dell is going to have to navigate here, but so far in his career in the UFC, he's been nothing but dynamite, and Randy Brown's going to have to kind of try to defuse that, but Randy Brown, he is a hard fighter to fight because of the length and because he's just very athletic. He... Likes to flow in there, great head movement, very evasive guy, and good job sticking you, kind of pot shotting you with, with uh, jabs, with straight punches, with push kicks, and then uh, making you miss, countering you, taunting you, getting you frustrated, getting you out of your game, and uh, he can just kind of pick at you for the whole fight. He throws some dangerous weapons too, he can bring up some big knees, he uh, will mix in some head kicks, some front kicks to the face. And uh, elbows, he definitely throws some techniques that can knock you out. But more, most of the time, he's a fighter that relies on volume, winning by decision. And his grappling has improved quite a bit. He's a pretty good grappler. He's out there in New York with that shark tank that they have, with uh, multiple gyms out there that have elite jujitsu fighters, with elite wrestlers and all that. And he's been right in there training with all them. But his wrestling to me is not very good. I mean, I've seen some of his shots and I feel like he just isn't a very natural wrestler. But in this fight, I think he may try to use the clinch 
and try to kind of close that space and get Madalena a little bit tired and maybe eventually try to somehow get it to the ground with a body lock or if he could time a takedown really well. We've seen him do that a couple times in the UFC. But the one thing with Randy Brown is I don't know if he's going to be able to hold Madalena down, which could be potentially an issue. But if I was him, I would definitely try to at least mix it up and make that an option because I think on the feet, even though he's slick and he has that evasiveness and counterability and he could keep it long, he does get touched sometimes. I mean, you've seen him get dropped against uh, Chaos Williams. We saw him get knocked out in a couple fights. Even though the fight against Deco Price where he got knocked out, it wasn't like he got caught on the feet with any wild child or anything. But um, we did see Vicente Luque get him out of there. And Jack Della Maddalena is a very sharp guy. I don't know if Randy Brown is going to be able to use that hands down, head movement, evasive uh against Madalena because Madalena is going to go to the body as well he's going to be timing his shots and using his accuracy picking his shots really well and I think that he's going to connect much more than some of Randy Brown's other opponents and when he connects he has that power in his hands that could put guys out and I do question Randy Brown's chin a little bit he is a super tough fighter but I don't know if he could take that punishment one thing that both these guys do um have issues with his leg kicks. I've seen Madalena have issues with it. I've seen Randy Brown have issues with it. But neither guy really throws a lot of leg kicks. I think Jack Della should invest in leg kicks in this fight if he can. If he has that in his arsenal, throw some leg kicks. And I've seen his kicking game. It's okay. But mainly when you look at Jack Della, what you really like with him is the boxing, man. The guy could box. He puts together great combinations. His pressure is elite. He throws a lot of volume. He is really diligent with attacking the body, and that's actually how he's gotten a couple of his finishes, or I believe all of his finishes so far in the UFC with body shots, or I guess not the Pete Rodriguez one, but he's finished a lot of guys with body punches, and he just, if you can get in the pocket with him, man, you're in trouble because he's super, super sharp. He keeps everything real tight, nice left hook. He is just very, very clean. The one thing is if you did watch the fight with Angelosa, um, he did struggle a little bit with the jab. And sometimes if you could pressure Madalena and push him backwards, throw combinations, then you could land on him a little bit. And that's what Randy Brown has to do. If you watch the fight with Randy Brown versus Chaos Williams, he turned that switch on. He was pressuring and trying to stay in Williams' face, backing him up and staying long, throwing combinations. And I think that's what he has to do against Madalena. He has to put himself in that fire to potentially get the victory. And if he can make it a super dog fight and be the guy on the front foot, back in Madalena up with a jab, using that length and throwing combos, long combinations, then maybe he has a chance to get the upset here. But if he lets Madalena get on that front foot pressure, back him against the cage and throw combinations himself on Randy Brown, he's going to be in trouble. And I think that... Randy Brown is just not going to do what he has to do early. I think Madalena is going to get started faster. And I feel like it's going to be an uphill battle for Brown. I think he's going to struggle to push Madalena backwards. And I think that Madalena is going to throw some leg kicks in this one. I feel like his body punching, like always, is going to play a big factor. I think he's going to kind of chop down that tree that Randy Brown is, the big tall guy that he is. And eventually get him against a cage, put a combination on him, and put him away like he has a lot of his other opponents. So I'm going to go with Jack Della Maddalena via first or second round KOTKO, and I think he's going to get him out of there with punches. And here we go. Now we're getting into the nitty gritty. We're getting into the co-main event, title fight, Yair Rodriguez versus Josh Emmett. Interim title fight, but it doesn't really matter, man. This is going to be a great one here. Both these guys are dynamic finishers. They can knock you out at any second, and they also can go to decision. They've shown great cardio. They're both the real deal. That's why they're in this title fight. And I think Yair Rodriguez, he is the more dynamic fighter of the two on the feet for sure. He's younger, and a couple of those things could potentially play a big advantage. And Josh Emmett, 37 years old, a little bit more meat and potato style, but it's proven to work for him. And he has that power to uh, turn the fight at any moment. He's very explosive. And with how I see this fight going for Josh Emmett, if he wants to win, I think that 
He's going to have to obviously get on the inside. On the outside, you don't want to be there against a guy like Yair that's so creative, that's going to be throwing a lot of kicks. He has to get in where he could land his big power overhands, his big hooks in the pocket. And I think that it's imperative of him in this fight to mix in the takedowns. I think that he has to go for a few even if he's not effective and at least give Yair that threat that he's going to level change and really commit to a couple takedowns. If he gets him down, that would be even better. But he has to do that to open up the striking, I think, because if he doesn't, I think Yair's going to come into the rhythm of being able to see the shots come in, side-to-side movement, cut angles, not go straight backwards, straight forwards, and kind of pick him apart a little bit at range. So Emmett has to give him something to think about with the level changes and use that to be able to land the hooks or the overhands over the top and kind of change the tide of the fight by landing his power shots because he's not going to be able to keep up with volume. And honestly, I don't really think he's going to be able to come in here and out-wrestle for five rounds a year. He's going to have to maybe use a takedown or two that he can get early to set up the striking late because I don't think he's going to have the cardio. And he just has not in any fights recently even gone for takedowns. So for him to... Go in there and have a game plan where he's going to shoot for takedown for five rounds and hold him down. I think that's just hard to imagine. But, man, I mean, Emmett, he's always live in any fight. He's 37 years old. He's had a lot of injuries, knee surgeries, lower body injuries. But it doesn't matter. I mean, the guy has that one-shot ability to change the tide of a fight. And even though he doesn't have a lot of knockout wins in the UFC, he's won the majority of his fights via decision. Getting those knockdowns, pushing guys back with the power, that could win you decisions. Just like we saw his last fight with Calvin Cater, even though I feel like Cater won the fight. And a lot of people feel like Calvin Cater won the fight. Emmett's power was able to put the tide in his favor and give him the victory in that one by decision. So that's definitely something that you have to factor in. Another thing that Josh Emmett that you never have to question and you have to give him maximum respect for is he's going to come in there with elite mentality he if he gets injured in the fight if he's coming into the fight hurt he is going to be able to battle through it like we saw in the Shane Burgos fight he is not going to get tired he's going to come in extremely well conditioned so the things that he can control he's going to control very well and Yair Rodriguez this guy is an underrated fighter in my opinion I think he's more now getting his respect after the Max Holloway fight and things like that but Yair Rodriguez is one of the most dynamic strikers in the UFC. You see him throwing elbows, spinning attacks, flying knees. He is extremely fast, good hands as well. He has that one-shot ability with uh, flying knees, with high kicks, with things like that. But his hands don't necessarily have that one-punch power. But I think that out of the two guys, Yair, even though he doesn't have the power in his hands, is more dangerous just because he has a bigger arsenal of weapons. And... Like I said, for Emmett, he's going to want to get on the inside. Yair's going to want to stay on that outside, throw those kicks, throw those shots up the middle, front kicks up the middle, knees. I think he's going to want to throw one-twos, always be moving side to side, never go straight backwards, don't get stuck against the cage, and just try to keep it long. Use those dangerous attacks. If Emmett gets in close and starts brawling with you, you know, maybe mix in a couple powerful shots and get him kind of thinking that, Every time I'm coming forward, I'm getting touched up and I don't want to move into that pocket anymore. If Emmett goes for takedowns, I think it could be a big turning point in the fight if Yair could fend a couple takedowns off or get back up to his feet if he's taken down because you could see Emmett maybe start to break a little bit or get a little bit, um, maybe not gassed out, but maybe slow down just a little bit and Yair could start to take advantage. Yair has shown... um, You know, some cardio deficiencies in the past when guys have made him wrestle. And his wrestling defense is not necessarily elite. We've seen him get taken down by Jeremy Stevens, by Frankie Edgar, where he finished him in that fight. Even Max Holloway got him down a couple times. And if Emmett does come in here with his wrestling at the max capability, Yair could maybe be in some trouble. But... I just don't think that Emmett's going to come in there with that wrestling. I think it's going to be more of a striking fight. And I just see Yair throwing the more volume, being a little bit more dynamic. I think Emmett has that puncher's chance. By Yair is a Mexican man. He has great conditioning. And his chin is on point. I've never really seen him have issues with durability in terms of getting knocked out. 
So I just feel like Ayer is going to be a little more dynamic. He's going to give Emmett trouble with his footwork movement, the distance control, the range, and the shots up the middle. I think that Emmett's not going to do what he needs to do in terms of mixing in the wrestling because just haven't seen it in recent fights for him. And I see Yair Rodriguez winning this interim belt. I'm going to say he wins by decision. And finally, we got the fight everyone came to see. We got the number one pound for pound fighter taking on the number two pound for pound pound for pound fighter with Alexander Volkanovsky fighting Islam Makachev. Alexander Volkanovsky returning home to Australia to do what a lot of people think is the impossible. You know, take Islam Makachev's belt, become a two division champion. Islam Makachev looking to claim that number one spot in the pound for pound rankings as he's as he just got the belt, moved into number two after beating Charles Oliveira. And something's got to give here, man. Both these guys on extremely long win streaks. Alexander Volkanovsky's undefeated in the UFC. Makachev obviously has the famous one knockout loss in the UFC. He's been on a double-digit win streak now. And someone's going to be either leaving with two titles or uh, no titles, man. I mean, Alex is going to have the 145-pound title regardless. But it's on Makachev, you know... He's going to be in his first title defense here, and we're going to see what happens. But with Islam, you know, we all know what we're going to see. He's going to use his dominant grappling, try to take Alexander Volkanovsky down, hold him down. But his last fight, man, he showed once again that his striking is underrated. He uses that southpaw style, good distance control. He's tall for the weight. He has, uh, you know, good long-range weapons with the one-twos, with the pull-twos, nice head kicks. Stays technical and doesn't really get in brawls. His defense has improved quite a bit. And um, he just keeps that distance very well. And then he times the takedowns when you close that gap on him. And just a very, very tough style to beat. When he gets on top of you, he's like a wet blanket. He's extremely hard to get up from under. His submission game is on point. His ground and pound is on point. There's not really a lot of faults you can give with Islam Makachev. One thing I do think is I think... Sometimes he can struggle a little bit with kicks. I think that he can have some big reactions to feints at times. And he is a little bit hittable, obviously, if you can get him into a straight striking bite, straight striking fight. And if he has to be on the feet here against Alexander Volkanovsky, I think he's going to be able to be competitive. But if he can't get the takedowns, then I think Volkanovsky is going to run away with the striking. And Islam, I mean, I think he's going to be able to take Volkanovski down. I really do. I don't think Volkanovski, I think his takedown defense is good. And obviously, I think it's going to be as good as it can be in preparation for this fight. But I think the battle is mainly going to be if Volkanovski can get up from bottom or if he's going to get smothered and held down. I don't think it's going to be a Volkanovski can defend every takedown because I've seen Volkanovski get taken down by multiple opponents at 145. And if he's getting taken down by those guys, I think definitely that Islam's going to be able to time some takedowns and get him on his back. But no one that we've seen thus far in the octagon has been able to hold Volkanovski down. He just has that uncanny ability to always stay active off of his back, keep it fluid, and just work back up to his feet almost almost immediately, seamlessly, and just extremely hard to control. Very, very strong guy, short stature. And it's just hard to corral him on the ground. He's usually right back up to his feet. And in the stand-up, he's one of the best strikers in the world. His boxing is elite. I think he is not in that conversation sometimes. And I think it's warranted that he should be as one of the best boxers in the UFC and in MMA. Because this guy has elite feints. His timing is on point. Speed kills. And this guy has incredible speed. His jab is nasty. Really good counter hooks in the pocket, both the left hook and the right hook. He mixes his levels up really well, attacking the body, attacking the head. And his footwork and feints are just unreal, man. He has some of the best in the division, some of the best in the entire UFC. And he's really good at pressuring you, staying in that boxing range, moving in and out, landing shots. And one thing that I think that really surprises a lot of opponents is just his weird body composition man I mean the guy is a short guy he has extremely you know when you look at him in Islam he looks just like he is gonna have way lesser reach right but then the guy has a longer reach arm reach than Islam does than Max Holloway does than all these guys that are significantly taller than him he's just built 
um, kind of strange like that with the abnormally long arms. And that gives him ability to land his jabs and just be really effective on the front foot and uh, land punches from areas where I think fighters are thinking that they're a little bit safe. And the other thing that Volkanovski has is a really effective kicking game. He throws the nice leg kicks, body kicks. And I just, like I said, I think this fight's going to come down to if Islam can hold him down or get him in a position and submit him, then it's going to be an easy night in the office for Makachev. But if Volkanovski can continue to get back up to his feet and get back in his face, I think Volkanovski has to pressure in this fight. I know a lot of people are thinking, oh, you know, you got to keep the distance to try to avoid the takedowns and things like that. But if you put someone on the back foot, it's harder to time the level changes. And I think that Volkanovski just has to pressure. He has to try to stay in Islam's face, back him up towards the cage, uh, throw combinations, use that jab, uh, use that in and out style, the feints, and uh, just try to keep Islam uncomfortable. Try to get him tired by keep standing up to your feet when he takes you down. And um, use that speed, man. You're going to be much faster on the feet. And if Volkanovski can do that and um, not get stalled out on the ground, not get stuck in a position and get submitted, then I think he has a great chance to win. But it's just tough for me to, to keep going against Islam and envision that, man. I feel like Islam, like I said, I think he's going to be able to get the takedowns. And we've seen Volkanovski get put in some really bad positions against fighters like Brian Ortega. Chad Mendez was even even able to take Islam or uh, Alexander's back. And I think if Islam gets gets him on the ground in those certain positions, I'm not saying he's going to finish the fight uh, because I think Alex is just a dog, man. I think the guy is extremely hard to finish. I think he's going to go out cold if he gets in a choke. I think he might even be one of those guys that could let his arm snap or something. But I think he's just going to be extremely hard to finish, and that's going to be a goal of his to make it to a decision. He's even said that he is you know, working – in the worst case positions where he's almost getting submitted and working out of it with four or five guys. And he's prepared to uh, defend subs just like he was against Ortega, I believe. But I just think if he gets put in those positions against Islam with the length that Islam has, the top positional control, just his ability to keep the pace and shoot 10, 15 takedowns if he has to as well, is going to eventually allow Islam to get the top control that he needs to start to take over the fight. And I think he can hold him against the cage as well. I think the size is going to be a big factor. And I would never bet against Volkanovski at that line. I mean, the line is pretty crazy to get Volkanovski over plus 300 anytime you see that number on a guy that is a number one pound for pound guy, multiple UFC title defenses, champion on a huge win streak in the prime of his career. It's hard to pass up, but Islam Makachev is a special fighter, and obviously you got to understand why the line is where it's at with Volkanovski moving up in weight classes. But, you know, like I said, I would never bet against Volkanovski at that price. I think it's a dog or pass situation here. I know a lot of people are going with Islam inside the distance, but I just feel like Volkanovski is going to be real tough, man. I think that one of his goals, I'm not saying that his goal is to go in there and lose a decision, but I think he's going to be really trying not to get finished. It's going to be in his home, in front of his home crowd. And I think that he's going to be in there for the long haul. I think he's just a dog like that. So I think this fight's going to go to decision. And I'm going to go with Islam Makachev to win by decision. 49-46, 50-45 type of decision. So Islam Makachev, I think, is going to retain his belt. And after that, we're going to have to see who he fights. Hopefully, they give Benio the chance. I think Benio is the last... Guy that I see, maybe Faziev, but we haven't really seen him test with a wrestler like that. But that I see, that could be a formidable test for Islam. But this fight's definitely going to be fun to watch. It's definitely going to be a fight that I'm not counting Volkanovski out in. I think that he definitely could potentially win, but it's just I got to go with Islam in this one. That's who I'm feeling. And thanks for watching, guys. It's a full card breakdown and prediction video for UFC 284. As far as bets go... I already have quite a few bets for UFC 284 posted on the Patreon. We've been killing it this year, man. We uh, just came off a pretty decent week last week. We put a free play on uh, YouTube with Jordan L. Lugo at plus 300, and he came through. So hopefully a few of you guys jumped on that one. And um, as far as my part of the week, my most confident um, pick here, for the part of the week, I'm going to go with Cleeton Rodriguez and Loma Luke Bumi. 
And um, my most confident pick, I'm going to say, um, I'm going to go with Loma Lukumi as the most confident pick of the night for this card. So uh, thanks for watching, guys. Like I was just saying, uh, subscribe to the Patreon for me. That would be awesome. You know, give me some money and let's make some money together because I almost guarantee you, man, we're going to make some money for the year. I have never had a losing year. And um, I'm in the top 10 in the world for uh, betting me tips for gambling. I feel like I give uh, a lot of great insights. So definitely go over to the Patreon and make yourself some money, man, by subscribing, joining the team. And other than that, man, uh, subscribe to the channel if you want to get more breakdowns like this. Put a like down below. Put a comment down below who you're betting. What you think about my breakdowns. Do you agree? Do you disagree? And uh, besides that, man, enjoy the fights. And I'll talk to you guys later.